say hi for you here and uh, for you to meet Scully. Since it's the first time that many of you are actually meeting Scully, I just wanted to tell you about my first encounter with her. I had just arrived as a, as a new student at my university and I duly received an invitation in the mail for a Friday night dinner at the Chabad house. Mostly out of deference to a uh, Lubavitch school teacher, I accepted the invitation and I turned up and had a very nice English Lubavitch rabbi. We had a very nice Friday night dinner. There were two other nice Jewish boy there, boys there and then on leaving, as I was saying my goodbyes, the rabbi said, come by for prayer sometime. And I smiled and thought, all right. <laughs> Fast forward three months. I'm on my way to a lecture, and another Jewish student who I knew called my name, and I walked over, and he told me he's going to play tennis with this bearded friend of his with a broad American accent. And uh, as I walked away, Shmuli said, come and play tennis sometime. And so I ended up going to prayers. <laughs> well, it worked. Oxford, Oxford days are uh, long behind us. What has endured is, is a friendship that I'm immensely grateful and very happy about. And uh, I've admired Shmuli's uh, talent, his energy, his dedication to his work ever since. Um, these stealth marketing tactics that he employed on me back in the day um, are also long behind us. I'd like to ask you to listen to what Shmuli has to say about his work. Asking yourself if this is something that you would like to have in the world. If this is something that you would support and something that you would like to contribute to. And without further ado, over to you. Good evening. I can only assume that when Doron said over to you, the air conditioning closet took that cue <laughs> that the introduction was for a piece of machinery. Otherwise, that was just too well timed. <laughs> a friend of mine visited from Australia recently. And he said to me, gosh, America has changed. When I was last here five years ago, smiled. He said, there seems to be such a depressing air. Our happiness is at the whim of forces outside of our control. Today the market was up 4%, so the people that I know were happy because they had more money. But on a day when the market is down, and the economy has been a shambles for the past four years, on the contrary, <coughs> Their mood is affected by what they don't have. What created this loss of wealth? If you were to watch the Republican presidential debates, or if you were to watch any recent speech being given by President Obama, you would be, you would be led to believe that America's problems are primarily economic. We have a high unemployment rate, we have a housing and mortgage meltdown. We have, according to Occupy Wall Street, very greedy bankers with 1% of the population controlling an extraordinary amount of the nation's wealth. And you, would, you could be forgiven were you to conclude that if some space alien who had an endless supply of money could become a naturalized American citizen by sneaking over the American-Mexican border in his little spaceship and then just give us oodles and oodles of cash, all of our problems would go away. Because 
Our crisis is one of money. What is it? We used to have a lot of money. Where did it go? The crisis the United States is facing today is not one of economics. It is one of values. I will easily prove it. We all had a house that was big enough, a car that was new enough, a job that was good enough. But we somehow decided somewhere between the mid-2000s that big could be bigger, that new could be newer, that young, if you're a man married to a woman, or perhaps even vice versa, young could be younger, that no matter what we had, it wasn't enough. Somewhere in the 2000s, a cavernous space opened inside us so that no matter what you put into it, it simply went out the other end. And we could not feel fulfilled, no matter what was given to us. So even if you gave us another 20, 30 trillion dollars, if you gave us 14 trillion and paid off the whole national debt, we would just clock up yet another debt in a decade, let alone maxing our credit cards, let alone feeling deeply dissatisfied with our <coughs> lover and sexual partner, our spouse, our kids. Nothing seems to be enough for us today. We even tell our children, that in order to earn love, there are certain ho hoops that they have to jump through. You've got to get into Harvard. You have to get a good AT SAT. You have to be good with a violin or with a piano. It seems that no matter what blessing we have, we somehow corrupt it through an absence of appreciation. And that's what happened to America. You see, people need values in order to determine that which is valuable. You need values in order to appreciate your blessings. What happened to America's values? Well, values primarily come from religion. It is religion that teaches us that people are valuable, but objects are less so. Because only concerning men and women does it say that they are created in the image of God. It doesn't say that even about a Ferrari. It doesn't say that even about some great mansion. It is religion that teaches us that the purpose of making money is to be generous and share that money. By the way, one of the most important lessons in that regard it comes from this week's Torah read, which was my Bar Mitzvah Parsha, by Yetze, the story of Jacob fleeing the wrath of his brother Esau, who wants to murder him. And Jacob says to God as he flees, if you will be good to me and give me food to eat and clothing to wear, I will make you my God. I will be a good Orthodox Jew, I'll be a religious Christian. Whatever the denomination, I will keep my religion and I will be observant. The commentators ask, and if God doesn't give you anything, you're going to abandon him? What is this, a business transaction? If God gives me food, then good. But if he gives me Bergen, Belsen, Auschwitz, and the Holocaust, then I'm an atheist. And that has happened with some, understandably, feeling abandoned by God. But what they explain, what the great commentator Maimonides explains, is that Jacob never said, if you give me money, I will be religious. He rather said, give me money so that I can be religious. I don't have any money. I can't send my kids to a Jewish day school. If I don't have any money, I can't invite guests for Shabbos meals, practicing hospitality. If I don't have money, I can't give charity. Give me the resources by which to do your will. Very interesting. The purpose of money is to consecrate it to a cause larger than yourself. That comes from values. It comes from a religious message, a spiritual message. So how did America lose its values? This great country was, based, was built on certain values. Democracy, meaning the infinite value of every person so that each vote is equal, which is the only way to explain why you and Milton Friedman have the same vote as to how to fix the economy. He's one of the world's greatest economists. You and I know next to nothing about economics. Why should we have the same vote? Because the Bible says that all people are equal. It may not even make sense. It's a super rational belief, but it's a source of our values. We'd rather get it wrong. We'd rather have the wrong people voting and choose the wrong government than ever believe that like a, in a fascist state, that the experts decide, they make decisions for the little people. We reject that because the Bible says that all of us are the same. We're all equally children of God, and no one person can determine your fate other than yourself. Religion gives us our values. So why did America lose them? It's such a religious country. 
if it were a secular country, again, I started by saying America has a deep financial hole. People think it's an economic problem. I then showed you really it's a, it's a problem with values. We've lost our values. Give us all the money in the world. We're going to squander it on garbage because we've lost our values. And then I'm asking, but America is such a religious country, so we should have good values. We should be raising our kids with good values. And no other country has in God we trust on its money. 90% of Americans believe in God. Hello, my friend. How are you? 90% of Americans believe in God. So how could such a deeply religious country, which is such a deep-seated faith, have lost its way? Here's the reason. It is not Jewish values that are being shared with the world. It is primarily Christian values. Do you know what Christian values have been reduced to in the United States? Two. Gay marriage and abortion. We've heard about these for 20 years. The only two values that are discussed in the political arena are homosexuality and abortion. So if you have a 50% divorce rate, our Christian brothers and sisters say to us, this is because gays want to get married. And if we stop them, we will save the institution of marriage. Just examine the argument for a moment. First of all, there are about, no one knows exactly, but even the high estimate is there are about 7% of the American male population is gay, and about 2% are lesbian. That gives you a combined total of 9%. But there's a 50% heterosexual divorce rate. And there was a 50% heterosexual divorce rate before any gay men came out of the closet beginning in the 1970s. And in fact, the only men who still want to get married in America are all gay. <laughs> <laughs> The straight guys date their girlfriends for 10 years, and when the girlfriend says, let's get married, as soon as the word comes out of her mouth, he can't breathe. He's broken out into a rash. In the meantime, the two gay guys are hiring lawyers, petitioning the United States Supreme Court so that they can get married, and all the straight guys are saying, go away! You're ruining the party! The narrow focus of American religious values on two issues has meant that we've never talked about real values. For 20 years we haven't. You want to really save the institution of marriage? Fight divorce. Make marital counseling tax deductible in the United States so that people have a financial incentive to get the help they need. That would save the institution of marriage. It's not as sexy as a cultural war between gays and, and, and heterosexuals, but it's far more effective. You want to save the institution of marriage? Create a healthier sexual ethic. You see, sex is one of the great clues that keep a man and a woman happily under the same roof for the duration of their lives. I spoke about this with Father Coutier two nights ago at this art gallery in, uh, in Aventura. But we have so diluted the power of the sexual by making it recreational. But there, isn't, there aren't a lot of tools left in our armory to sew two strangers together as bone of one bone and flesh of one flesh. You really want to save the institution of marriage? Create a national family dinner night so that families can have what every Jewish family has, so that American families can copy the oldest of all Jewish traditions, going back to the six days of creation. One day, every week, where kids gather around a table and they have no electronic distractions. You are not fighting to get their attention with Facebook. They are not tweeting what an awful father you are. They are you are not competing with the iPod earbuds that create so much noise that they can only tune you out. What I'm trying to say is, you want to save America? <coughs> Give it a Jewish voice. Let's hear finally about universal Jewish values. 
that have made the Jewish community the envy of the world in the two aspects where America most fails. Number one, strong families. Number two, strong communities. The more people connect through love and friendship, the less they need physical objects to make them happy. Don't you get it? All of these sales, Black Friday, people camping out at Macy's four days before Thanksgiving. All of these sales where you buy something that you don't need at 50% off, only to sell it at 90% off on eBay the following week, which is what made eBay one of the most successful startups in history, to get rid of all the clutter you never wanted in the first place. All of this is filling a need. And the need is love. You're supposed, to be, you're supposed to fill your life with a feeling of significance. I matter. And if I were taken up by some space aliens in a ship to do <coughs> medical or sexual experimentation on me for many years, and my absence was suddenly felt here on Earth, what would the world be missing? You're supposed to feel that you have made a contribution to other people's lives so that when you are no longer present, you are actually missed. And when you feel that way, you don't run on empty, and you don't need artificial fuel. The number one remedy for unhappiness in America is not Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil, and some of the miracle drugs of our generation. Less so is it a shot of Jim Beam, or Jack Daniels, or Glenn Libet, or, or Blue Label. The number one remedy for unhappiness in America is the impulse purchase. It's not even to shop. It's to buy something when you're not planning to buy anything. And you're doing it because it gave you a day or two of making you feel good about yourself. When Oprah chose me as a marriage, parenting, and relationship expert to host a daily radio show on the Oprah and Friends Network, she chose seven experts in the seven fields that she thought were the most relevant to people's lives. So there was spirituality and relationships, which I focused on, along with, uh, at the time, Eckhart Tolle, which he highlighted in his book, The Power of Now. Finance, Gene Chatsky, Medicine, Dr. Mehmet Oz, The Culture, Gail King, etc. And then suddenly there was a seventh guy doing clutter. Clutter? That's one of the seven most important areas of life? But Oprah felt that people were becoming so dependent on things <coughs> that you couldn't even walk into their home any longer. And she was right. That was the show that really took off. People can't give items away, even in the holiday season now, to the Salvation Army, because they define themselves by what they have. Were Descartes alive today, he would have to modify his famous saying, I have, therefore I am. <laughs> Not cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Or, from a, the, a Jewish perspective, I relate, therefore I am. Here it would be I have. And if you have, and that's what makes you you, you can't give up what you have. Even something that's worthless. It's still part of you. That's why we need a Jewish voice in American society. You know what kills me about being Jewish? and about being someone who's had the privilege of studying Jewish texts. Going back to the time when my mother worked two jobs, my mother was here this evening, so that I could go to a Jewish day school. Or going back to the time when Rabbi Shneel Zalman Felig, who's also here, inspired me to take a much deeper commitment to Chabad Lubavitch. <coughs> what unnerves me about being Jewish is seeing the richness of our wisdom the depth of our values, how healing they are, but how unknown they have remained. No one knows anything about our tradition. I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about non-Jews. Why is it that the Christians believe they should be sharing their wisdom with America? Why is it that the Muslims believe that they have a truth that should be shared with the world? Why are the Mormons now launching a national advertising campaign saying, I am a Mormon, 
elevated as their profile currently is with two presidential candidates who are Mormons and the top Broadway show of all time, <laughs> let alone the Olympics in 2000, in Salt Lake City. And yet the Jews, we continue to believe that we have nothing to share with anyone else. Me and my organization are focused on two things, and two things only. Number one, spread universal Jewish values and wisdom to the widest possible audience, Jew and non-Jew alike. In fact, if you want to influence the Jewish community, the most effective way is to influence the non-Jewish world. Because what is the history of the Jewish people ever since the emancipation in the 18th century, when Jews were finally allowed out of their ghettos, when they were granted full citizenship in Germany, in France, <coughs> in England, as the European emancipation gained steam, what is the history of the Jewish people? We've wanted to be accepted by the non-Jews. We have a word for that. It's called assimilation. But what if the non-Jews were so enamored of Jewish wisdom that when a Jew <laughs> assimilated, he assimilated into Judaism? Because his non-Jewish friends are reading books like The Blessings of the Skin Knee by Wendy Mogul, which is the number one parenting manual in America today, a reformed Jewish woman who decided in her practice as a child psychologist that she was feeling frustrated in her inability to heal kids. So she, she decided on, on, on a whim to discover what does her own tradition say about healing children. And she hired a reform rabbi to study the Talmud with her, and she amalgamated all the teachings of the Talmud into one book about how to raise kids. And the New York Times Magazine put it on their cover story, and they said this is the most profound book on raising kids that has come out in a long time. And it became a... a, a Phenomenal. All based on wisdom we Jews would never study because we think that the tradition is empty, that it's vacuous. Or my book, Kosher Sex, which I really wrote without any expectations. I didn't know how it would do. I wrote it because I felt I had to give wisdom and advice to my students at Oxford. And the manuscript was originally for them. I couldn't get a publisher. The book was about Jewish teachings on sexuality, how, sexual, how sexuality can be used to induce emotional intimacy. I published that in 1999. I couldn't get a publisher. There was a publisher in England that was doing a series called An Intelligent Person's Guide to X. So An Intelligent Person's Guide to Philosophy, An Intelligent Person's Guide to Christianity. They asked me to do An Intelligent Person's Guide to Judaism. I said to them, aha, uh -huh, I will, but only if it's a two book deal. <laughs> you see, I have a manuscript that's sitting gaining dust called Kosher Sex. They laughed at it. They thought it was some sort of joke. I said, well, then I want to do your intelligent person's guide. It's a two-book deal. They said, fine, fine. We'll give you a few thousand dollars for, 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 for your sex book just to make you happy as long as you do this book. This is what we're really interested in. And when they published it, we had no expectations. And I don't say this because I wrote it, but rather I say it because it is what it is. Kosher Sex is now widely regarded as one of the most important relationships books over the past quarter century and has been translated into 20 languages. And I don't say this because I'm its author. Really, I just took Jewish wisdom and I put it down on paper. And so many Christians and Catholics and non-Jews who were being taught that sex is about procreation, they warmed to this method. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and leave his mother. He shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That the purpose of sex is to take two strangers and transform them through a powerful experience that renders them emotionally connected and even inseparable. And that's not happening today. And people miss it. They miss that intimacy. I believe that the healing of America will come about through Jewish wisdom and Jewish values. I believe the American Jewish community must fundamentally shift its focus to bring its wisdom to the widest possible audience. I hosted a show on TLC called Shalom in the Home. And the whole show was about fixing American families through Jewish advice and Jewish wisdom. I'll give you but one example. My family knows this woman quite well because she now visits. She lives in Florida. Every show, every episode was a different theme. And one of the themes we dealt, dealt with was grief. There was a woman in Orlando who had written to us that she and her husband went out for a romantic dinner on Valentine's Day. And he, they were driving his Corvette, this is six years ago, and as they were coming home, he got into a terrible accident, and his head hit the windshield, 
and he bled to death, and his wife laughed. And she couldn't overcome the grief. And it was these two little girls had only one parent. But she was so grief stricken, she couldn't even raise them with any kind of love. So I, I go into the house with our crew, and I see that there's these black and white photos of him everywhere. They're looking very somber, very serious. She would sit her children down every day and teach them about her father. And again, it wasn't about the jokes he told. It wasn't about humorous stories. It was about how empty their lives are ever since he died. It was such a morbid experience. And nobody smiled and nobody laughed. And I was with her for three days. On the third day, I pull her into my Airstream trailer and I say to her, Carol, on the last day of his life, Moses, lecture the Jewish people. And in the final sentiments he expressed to them, he said, today I die, and I set before you life and death. And for the rest of your lives and the lives of descendants and generations that follow you, they will always face this choice of life and death. And I enjoin you I adjure you, I command you, today and always, to choose life. I said, Carolyn, everything in life involves a choice between life and death. You come home from work. You can choose the liveliness of playing with your children and doing homework, or the death of sitting and vegetating in front of a television. How many marriages have died in death and neglect? through a husband who doesn't even talk to his wife. The number one complaint the wives have against their husbands is that he won't speak to me. You have a friendship that has been going for many years, but someone didn't invite you to a party, or they said something hurtful, or you heard it from the grapevine. And now, you don't want to forgive them. It's a choice between the life of their relationship or the cold death of alienation and estrangement. You're about to invest a lot of money. It's a choice between whether you're going to be a scoundrel and there could be some life in that hard work you're putting into the market, or it could be entirely speculative and you're just gambling. And you really invested your finances. Everything in life involves a choice between life and death. I'm tired. I'm sick of it. Sometimes death barges in. Uninvited. And it feels very touch joy. And then it's a sinking moment. It's the sun dark. That's what happened to me. You didn't choose that. It chose you. But you invited him to remain in an unexpected He took your husband and then you invited. Let's speak only about the death of our husband and father. Let's only have pictures that make him look like he's entombed. Let's only tell morbid stories of what was lost. Did he ever even live, or did he only die? I say this to my Christian friends. I just wrote a book called Kosher Jesus, which is being published on the 1st of February. It's about the Jewish people's Christians for the Christian market. It's been 10 years to write it. And I say to my Christian friends all the time, you're impressed with Mel Gibson? And movies like The Passion of the Christ, movies about death, glory, blood. Jesus only died, that's the whole religion, or he lived a certain life in a certain way, which you're supposed to find inspirational. Notice that we Jews have no time for death. And no one knows, the Bible says, where Moses is buried till today. We don't make shrines of the place of Moses. We read the story, the living Torah. You can choose life. And from that day forward, honestly, that woman changed her life. Took down all the somber pictures and put up color photos of her husband holding his children and laughing and smiling when they were born. She started this tradition of taking balloons, and the girls would write their father these little messages every birthday on the day that he died and put them in the balloon and then let it go up to the heaven so their father could read it. They decided that what their father most loved in terms of acts of compassion and kindness was visiting his neglected grandmother. And in his honor, they chose an act of life. The girls on his birthday, on the day he died, go to a home for the elderly 
and they sing and they dance and they bring presents. That's just a single example of how healthy the Jewish outlook of life can be, if only we were to share it. If you go to FridaysFamily.com, you'll see that Dr. Mehmet Oz, Dr. Phil, Kathy Lee Gifford, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa of Los Angeles, Mayor Cory Booker of Newark, House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, who's the highest elected Jewish official in American history, et cetera, et cetera, have all done 30-second ads that air on the networks asking non-Jewish families across the United States to embrace the triple two. Every Friday night, give your children two uninterrupted hours where no... substantive topic uh, to their children about because families don't, you know, studies show you put two people together on a date or a father and a son and within seven minutes they talk about the latest movie or television they watched. And the last two is you invite two guests so that the family is taught to have a home that is the tent of Abraham. My daughter got married four weeks ago, thank God, and I explained that under the chuppah, a chuppah is a roof with no walls. It is the tent of Abraham. It's not designed to lock anyone out. You can't lock it even if you wanted to. So that's what my organization focuses on, this world, the Values Network. We bring Jewish values to the largest possible audience. We have a very high profile on CNN, Fox, MSNBC, ABC, NBC. Um, we publish a huge amount of columns and articles, four times a week in the Huffington Post, Wall Street Journal, the Jerusalem Post, the Washington Post, the LA Times, a host of Jewish publications, etc., cetera, um, and radio, and we're very focused on magnifying Jewish values in the media and bringing it to the widest possible audience. Our annual budget, we do all this for a very small budget, our annual budget is something in the region of $680,000 last year. Uh, we'd like to kick up to a million, but in this economy, we'd be happy to get what we have even last year. But we're the only ones actually doing this, and I believe that this is going to be the next phase of the Jewish community, reaching out to the mainstream culture and the non-Jewish world, and, and impacting on, on Jews specifically through the culture. I can tell you, for example, how many tens of thousands of Jewish men and women wrote to me while I hosted Shalom of the Home, how proud they were to see a rabbi healing non-Jewish families, mainstream families, with the power of Jewish ideas and the power of Jewish wisdom. And we'd like to continue that. So Daron was one of the first students I ever met at Oxford. He remains one of my dearest friends till, till today. He's what I call a Yudid Nefesh, a soul friend. It's the kind of friendship that never needs rekindling. It's the kind of friendship, we dare not neglect our friendships, but if Daron and I had not seen each other for millennia, our conversation would resume exactly where it had been left off before, because we've created a soul bond. I was with him in his formative years, from 18 to about 21. Well, my formative years, I'd like to think, still continue. <laughs> <laughs> I said 18 to 21. <laughs> hmm. And I was only uh, marginally older than him when I arrived at Oxford, and that's, we were almost the same age. I mean, Came very close and remained so all these years. I married Dorna and Annabelle at their wedding in London. Um, and I thank you very much for putting this evening together. I don't want to take any more of your time. There's another student, one of my students who's here, Amy Lindenbaum, who uh, originates from New York but now lives in South Florida, was also with us at Oxford. He's, not, he's now my He's now my photographer. He's part of my posse. <laughs> he doubles as my bodyguard. <coughs> He's also my hair stylist and beard stylist. <laughs> <laughs> we are a registered 501c3. And we're happy to take anything that you're kind enough to offer. You know, there's a... Uh, there's, uh, I, I gave a lecture on Monday night with Father Coutier.
David's going to say, wait, I, wait a second. He did things to me on the ground or bastards. They're going to think I'm stealing something off the wall. I said, no, no, don't worry. And sure enough, the mom said to me, be on time at 7 o'clock. So at 6.45, we'll get my lunch time to leave. I'm walking out. And three security guards, so where do you think you're going? <laughs> and I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, a speech. I said, you can't, you can't. Uh, where's your receipt? I said, I brought this with me. It was given to me right outside. I brought it in. Yes, of course you brought it in. <laughs> <laughs> but then a miracle happened. He had two, a miracle happened. Two non-Jewish security guards walked over and told the woman, we watch his TV show all the time. Uh. So I looked at the, so she said, what, that doesn't mean you didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go. So I said, you know what? Either arrest me. I told her wrong. Right? I said, either arrest me or I'm going to my speech. Um, she said, she said, I'll. I'll so the woman said, uh, we'll, we'll compromise. Give us your phone number, and we'll call you later to find out exactly what the score says. Okay. So if we auction it off quickly, you will be. You will probably have the Miami police visiting you at home. <laughs> Miami Beach police visiting you at home this evening. No doubt, the guy that gave it to me is probably a drug mule. <laughs> and we'll just, when we cut this open, we'll find like bags of cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe he was a chiropractor. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a philanthropist. He supports many causes. He's a very nice man. And I'm very really grateful to him. And I'm told it's a, it's a Dali print from the Divine Comedy. Okay, so there's that as well. And um, whoever is interested in, in offerings of support would be very grateful. And Don has kindly offered to collect. Checks, cash, gold teeth. Whoever discarded husband.